I have some contemplations on the gospel. Number two, belief is not passive. Belief is not without consequences. The most quoted scripture in Christendom is probably John 3, 16. And it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. What is it that men must believe about him in order to lay hold of everlasting life? Because I hope you know that not everyone who believes in Jesus believes in Jesus. The Muslims, for example, believe that Jesus was a prophet of Allah. They believe that he was born of a virgin, but they reject any suggestions or any claims about his divinity or consubstantiality with the Father. Eastern religions like Buddhism sometimes reference Jesus as a wise man, a teacher of spirituality, but that's just about it. He's just one of many other teachers. I go to evangelize to Muslim people. And when I mention the importance of believing in Jesus, many of them are quick to tell me, oh, I believe in Jesus. So in fact, no one can call himself a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. And then when I go on to say that Jesus is the only way to eternal life, that he's the only name that has been given by which man can be saved from his sin, that he's the way, truth and life. They say, oh no, that's too much. Often in my evangelistic labors, I encounter people who tell me that they are Christian. And sometimes I pray with them, you know, encourage them in their walk. But other times I'm just moved to ask, why are you a Christian? Can you please explain to me what that means? How do you know that you're a Christian? What is the basis of your faith? And they are clueless. They don't know what to say. Yes, we believe the gospel and we are saved. But if you do not know what you believe and the consequence that that believing holds, do you really believe? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 encapsulates the makeup of the gospel message in these three points. One, that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Two, that Jesus was buried. Three, that Jesus rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Each of these three points that I have listed are consequential and directly affects the life state and nature of the believer jesus died for my sins because i was hopeless helpless and lost i was crushing under the weight of my sin a candidate of the wrath of a holy god who must punish sin i was a guilty offender on death row the nature of sin that i inherited from the first adam was ravaging me on the inside so even if i wanted to pay for my own sin with my own life i couldn't have I couldn't have because clean water cannot flow out of a dirty pipe. Who I intrinsically was, was a sinner. I was not a sinner because I sinned. I sinned because I was a sinner. My nature was what dictated my works. So everything I did and everything that I could have done in order to make good for my sins before a perfectly holy, perfectly straight God in whom there's not even a fragment of crookedness would have still grossly fallen short. So Jesus, who was God revealed in the flesh, a perfectly holy man who did not inherit my Adamic nature, took my place on that cross and drank the cup of wrath that I should have drunk. This Jesus who died was buried and rose again after three days as proof that he had offered the perfect sacrifice for sin. That God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus once and for all on behalf of sinful men. That God was pleased with it. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. And if God was pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it means that there's no price left to be paid on my part for my sin except for believing and receiving what Jesus has done. So that if I believe in what Jesus Christ has done, no longer will I be hopeless, lost, and dead in my sin. If I believe in this, his death, burial, and resurrection, it means that I'm forgiven. It means that I'm no longer an enemy of God. It means that Jesus has paid the perfect price to redeem me from the punishment of my sin and deliver me from the influence of it. That where before all I knew how to do was sin, now because I believe in and understand what Jesus has done, I make a deliberate decision to turn away from a life of sin because why remain a slave of what Jesus died to save me from? How can I say that I believe that Jesus died to redeem me from my sin, but still continue to feel at home in it? It means that I do not believe. 
How can I say that I believe that this plane, I mean, is about to crash but refuse to grab onto my parachute? It simply means that I do not believe that the plane will crash. I do not believe because I say that I believe. I believe because I act that I believe. It is why Romans 10.10 10 says that with the heart man believes and is justified. Believes what? That he cannot help himself. That he's a sinner in need of a savior and this savior is Jesus Christ. There is first a working upon the heart. There is a recognition of the soul's poverty and this is necessary. Salvation cannot happen apart from a heart work. And only then it says is confession made unto salvation. If there's nothing happening here, it does not matter what you say here. It's why it's not just about merely saying, I believe. Believing is not passive. What do you believe? How is it going to change the way you live your life going forward? Because that is the true confirmation of your faith. Listen, when Christ died on that cross, in some beautiful, mysterious sense, I died with him to my sin. For when Jesus calls men, he first calls them to come and die. And when he rose, I rose with him alive to God in righteousness. When I say that I believe in Jesus Christ, this is the thing that I believe. This is the gospel that has saved me.